Thank you for coming back. Um, so we have our last talk today by Professor Michel Baudouin Lafont, who is at the University of Paris Saclay and also this year's winner of the Medaille d'Argent in computer science for um, in France here. And Michel and I have worked together for over well about 30 years now, so I know him very well. Um, I'm married to him actually, so I know him really well. And, um, but I invited him here because he has this extraordinary background in human-computer interaction and basically one of the founders of the field and certainly here in France. And what he's going to do is talk at a higher level and talk more about how we think about human-computer interaction and then how to get to human-computer partnerships from an HCI perspective. So, Michel. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about this, these topics. Um, so the, the title is Information Theory Meets Human-Computer Partnerships. Uh, that's a big title. I don't know if I will deliver on it, but you'll tell me at the end. Um, first of all, I would like to, since there's a word theory in the, in the title, I would like to talk a little bit about the role of theory in human-computer uh, interaction. Um, this is actually the slides that Wendy <laughs> had yesterday in her talk, but there was a glitch and, and she couldn't really present them. Um, and uh, as she was explaining, uh, based on, on the work she did with uh, Anne-Laure Fayard uh, in the last century, uh, <laughs> um, uh, in, in, uh, in the sciences, in the natural sciences, uh, research goes back and forth between theory and observation. And so in some uh, fields, you may start from a theory. Um, I think the example you take is psychology or, or physics. And then you build uh, experiments to support or <laughs> uh, refute your theory. And then you revise or extend your, your theory. And then you do new observations, et cetera. In other fields, uh, say you know uh, anthropology, for example, you, you start from observations of the real world. Um, and then from that, you build they tend to call them frameworks rather than theories, uh, then, then prompt for new observations to, again, refine and, uh, and extend it. So this is all nice and, and good. Now, in HCI, we are in what uh, Herb Simon calls a science of the artificial, uh, in that we are creating artifacts. And uh, we uh, actually uh, change the nature that, of the things that we are studying, which is not supposed to be the case in natural sciences, where you're supposed to be a, a, an external, unbiased observer. Um, here, we create the artifact that they when study. And uh, the research process uh, then goes back and forth between theory and artifact creation, observation and artifact creation, and then evaluation of the artifact, and then uh, using more theory or, or refining a theory uh, for this particular problem, and et cetera. Now, in, uh, uh, in, in the history of uh, human-computer interaction, a lot of uh, uh, design methods have been developed uh, and I would place them in, in here between uh, observation and artifacts. So when we do uh, interviews, when we do participatory design, uh, when we do surveys, questionnaires, uh, uh, evaluations through qualitative or quantitative means, uh, it all sits in between there. And uh, theory is sort of floating above there, like we talk about the theory of affordances. Um, but but it's, it's not really operationalized in our design, uh, in our research process, uh, in the same way as these design methods have been over the years. And so together with uh, Susanna Botker from the uh, University of Aarhus in Denmark and, uh, and Wendy here, um, we um, uh, uh, published a paper last year which was a result of a long uh, history of uh, research together and reflecting on the role of theory. Um, and we introduced the notion of generative theory of HCI. And the goal of these generative theories is to bridge the gap, in a sense, between the, the body of existing theories from the natural science, from psychology, from uh, sociology and, and ethnography, et cetera, um, and this process of, of building artifacts. Now, this is not a one or the other. Uh, you still have to use the design methods like participatory design, but we're adding a means to integrate uh, theory uh, in, in a more operationalized way in the, the design process. Um, and so, what is a generative theory? So, a generative theory first has to be grounded in existing theories of human behavior. 
Um, and that can be a range of things. I mentioned uh, theory of affordances from Gibson. I'll come back to Gibson in a minute. Um, I'll also talk about uh, Paul Fitz and Fitz Law, which was uh, you know, there before HCI existed. Uh, there are things like distributed cognition that we also uh, talk uh, about in, in HCI a lot. Um, boundary objects, all these uh, existing theories of uh, human behavior, either individual or social. Or, um, and and uh, in recent years, there's also you know, cultural studies that have come into play and all that. But these theories tend to be abstract in the sense that they, they don't apply immediately to HCI. So a generative theory of interaction identifies a set of concepts and uh, uh, operationalizes them in, in, in a set of generative principles so that uh, these theories become uh, usable, I would say, uh, in, a, in our HCI design process. So um, in the uh, talk I give in, the, in lesson uh, two of, of uh, um, uh, Wendy's uh, uh, chair here, um, I talked about reification. The idea that an abstract concept can be turned into a concrete object that user can manipulate. So reification uh, gets inspired from a theory called uh, uh, technical reasoning, uh, also from the theory of affordances. And, uh, uh, but reification is something that we can apply. And for the past 20 years, we've been teaching that to our students, to our group. <laughs> uh, and we've been using it very productively. And I showed a few examples in, in that uh, talk. Um, now, the, the, the way to use the theories is through three, len is through three lenses. Uh, one, uh, the first one is what we call the analytical lens. Uh, those concepts can be used to uh, analyze, to deconstruct the uh, existing artifacts. So um, to observe and uh, interpret existing artifacts through those principles. Um, the, critical lens sort of extends this analytical lens by being critical of these uh, uh, existing artifacts, but again, through uh, th those principles. So um, I can say, well, uh, you know, in this system, they did not use reification, uh, but if they did, this is what it could have given them. Um, and that sort of opens the way to revising existing artifacts or creating new ones. Uh, and then the last one is the constructive lens, uh, which is really what gives the name generative uh, uh, theory of interaction, where we use those principles, uh, I don't want to say out of the blue, but not necessarily based on existing uh, artifacts, but to create new solutions. And uh, in, the, in, in, in the lecture I give, uh, I talk about how with reification, we created this alignment guidelines that help people uh, align objects on the screen a lot more efficiently. And so uh, the, the goal of all this is that you can create new artifacts and then uh, sort of participate in this uh, process that I was illustrating before. So what we find is this uh, concept of generative theory is, is uh, quite powerful because um, uh, oftentimes we, we really are at, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to find how to apply a, a particular theory. And uh, what we uh, call for in the paper I was citing is for the community to create more of these uh, generative theories. Uh, in the paper, we give three examples from our respective work. Uh, Wendy has talked about co-adaptation uh, as another uh, one of these uh, generative uh, uh, theory with principles like uh, discoverability, uh, expressivity, and appropriability. Um, but, but, but we should have more of these, uh, of these theories. More theory is good. You know, the history of theories is that some survive, some disappear, some merge, some get developed, etc. And so we need the same thing in HCI. Okay, so um, now what I'm going to talk about in this talk is a, a, a body of theory around the notion of information. Um, I borrowed also this drawing from <laughs> Wendy's slides, uh, which is interaction uh, between a human and a computer. And uh, we want to treat interaction as a phenomenon that we can study and a phenomenon that we can control. Designing new artifacts on the computer side is a way to create a phenomenon of interaction and to control it, in a sense. Now, um, if we consider uh, these two arrows that represent the phenomenon of interaction, what is that is being sent uh, by the user to the computer? What is uh, being sent by the computer to the user? What are these arrows? 
Now, in, in many um, HCI uh, classes, uh, we say, well, the, the user provides input to the computer, or the user enters commands. And that can be by typing, by clicking, by speech, by gesturing, all of that. And then the system processes it, and then sends back a response. And the response is typically updating the display, or maybe making a sound, or, or, or having a, a voice uh, synthesis, or something like this. Now, what if instead we think of these exchanges as exchanges of information? That is, taking interaction as the uh, communication of information from the user to the system, from the system back to the user. Now, if we talk about interaction, uh, there are a couple of theories there that have uh, uh, addressed the, the, uh, the topic of how humans interact uh, our systems interact in terms of information. And I'll mention uh, two here. One is James Gibson. Now, uh, James Gibson is a psychologist who uh, is uh, famous for having um, uh, initiated the, the movement called ecological uh, psychology uh, and the notion of ecological perception. Now, in HCI, uh, he is known mostly for the notion of affordance, which has been, I must say, butchered by <laughs> uh, a lot of... Uh, um, uh, misunderstanding of, of what the concept is really about. But I'm not going to talk about affordance today because, uh, in fact, affordances in his work are a very small part of, of his work. Um, in his book, The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception, uh, he talks about how uh, organisms, animals, not just humans, have co-evolved with their environment. And that coevolution, of course, links with the notion of coadaptation that when he, when he has been talking about. But here he's really talking about coevolution, coevolution at the uh, scale of, of uh, evolution, Darwinian evolution, so millennia. Um, and so his argument is um, organisms have evolved to perceive what there is to perceive in the world that is meaningful to them and to their survival. And for this, they have developed elegant perceptual processes. Elegant, uh, I quote because that's how he calls it, elegant and parsimonious, meaning uh, uh, sort of uh, energy efficient in a way. Um, and so he studied in particular um, visual perception and uh, uh, has a whole uh, development around the notion of uh, perceiving the optical array, what he calls the optical array, and the optical flow. And his big argument is that we always tend to think of uh, our visual system as, you know, we have a little camera in the brain behind our eyes that's uh, filming what's going on, and then, you know, some, something there that he calls the homunculus uh, interpreting that. And he's saying that doesn't work because how does the homunculus work? And so the way visual perception works uh, is not uh, the way sort of... Uh, uh, a, uh, a system that has uh, a visual analysis from, uh, uh, from arrays of pixel is, is working. And in particular, he has this notion of information pickup. The idea that we extract information from the, from the world that is what we need for the, the particular activity at hand. And so in this uh, picture, which is on the uh, cover of the book, you see this bird flying. And these arrows here represent the optical flow, meaning from one image, uh, one image to the next, that would be this, uh, the wrong analogy, but as you move through space, things move around you. And so you can imagine replacing each little uh, pixel in your surrounding by a little arrow of how it has moved from, from the previous uh, snapshot. Um, and so uh, things that are uh, on your side uh, tend to move faster than things that are right in front of you. And in fact, uh, there is something that he calls an invariant, that is that in any optical flow due to locomotion, the only fixed point in this optical flow is the direction towards which you're going. And he argues that our visual system perceives that directly. Now, whether or not our perceptual system is equipped to extract those invariants and how it works exactly is not our concern here. Uh, however, there is ample evidence that the visual system has neurons that are uh, sort of uh, uh, <laughs> programmed to extract uh, things like vertical lines or corners or things like this. So uh, there's a lot of support for this idea. 
The other strong uh, concept in, uh, in, in this theory is the notion of action-perception coupling. And it was uh, mentioned actually yesterday by one of the uh, speakers. Uh, you need to act to perceive. I think it was, was it Jim? Um, you need to act to perceive and you need to perceive to act. You need to act to perceive because, uh, for example, if you're touching uh, something, you need to move your hand to, to have uh, an actual sensation. Uh, your eyes always do micro movements. If they don't, you don't see. It's that simple. Now, you also need to perceive to act because, of course, if I'm trying to, to, to grab an object uh, here on the desk, uh, my eye are going to guide my movement. Uh, a robot would be perfectly able to uh, take a picture, then close the camera, and then uh, move the arm to the uh, perfect position. But a human wouldn't be able to do that, even if nothing moves and all that. It's very hard to, to do this. So we need to, to, to act, uh, we need to uh, perceive our surroundings in order to uh, act efficiently. This is a picture I also borrowed from Wendy's talk that when she mentioned uh, uh, Gibson uh, with this idea of invariant. If you uh, throw a ball at a dog or another human being, uh, the sure way to catch the ball, even if there is wind or if the ball does weird things or here the stick, uh, is to maintain a constant angle between the motion of the ball and, and your own motion. Um, and so this is a type of invariant that we're talking in information theory, uh, in uh, <laughs> the ecological uh, um, perception. OK, now, as you can see, this is not a theory that we can apply <laughs> sort of readily. Um, and uh, I think to this day, we haven't really figured out how to operationalize this, this notion. But I think the notion of invariance is, is interesting and is captured uh, uh, in, for example, the rules of Gestalt, uh, Gestalt perception. And uh, Gibson talks about the Gestalt, which was uh, the theory that was existing be before then, uh, where you know, the way objects are laid out uh, is perceived globally instead of individual objects. It's also captured in a lot of uh, principles that are used in, uh, in animation to, uh, to, to convey the, the notion of, uh, of, of a movement that is natural. Um, and for example, if I move my hand from here to here, you feel that I've moved it at constant speed, which of course is impossible because I started uh, without move motion and I ended without motion. So I accelerated and then went uh, slower. But for you, I went from A to B in sort of linear movement. And so uh, all, all these things sort of build on this uh, theory of, of uh, in, uh, invariant extraction in a sense. OK, so that's for uh, James Gibson. Now we turn to the other uh, big guy in uh, information theory, Claude Shannon. So Claude Shannon uh, invented uh, the theory of information in, in well, around 1948, uh, seminal papers from 1948. And um, he uh, imagined this concept of information uh, when working on how to transmit information over uh, telephone lines or, 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 or landlines or uh, any kind of medium. And his uh, concept is that the information car carried by an event uh, that has a probability p of x is this formula log of 1 over the probability, which is equivalent to minus the log of the uh, probability. Now, we don't need to understand what that means, really. Uh, the point is that the more uh, unlikely an event is, the higher information it carries. So if I throw uh, a, a coin, it can go on heads or, or, or tails, uh, and it's a 50-50% uh, chance. So if you apply the formula, you'll see that a particular draw will carry an information of one bit, which means I can encode it in one bit. One for tails, zero for heads, for example. For a dice, because there are six possibilities, uh, a, a particular outcome will carry more information, because uh, there are uh, more uncertainty about the, the outcome. Now, based on this concept of a, uh, information, there is then the concept of entropy, which if you consider random variables, so if you throw the dice a number of times, uh, what is, on average, the, the information that uh, uh, will be provided by a particular draw, uh, which is also an estimate on the amount, the number of bits you need to encode uh, that information. One, and I don't want to go into the details of, of any of this, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the entropy is going to be maximal uh, when the distribution is uniform. If your dice is six uh, sides and, and they're all uh, equivalent, then you have the entropy of 2.53 that I mentioned. 
uh, if some sides of the dice are, are more likely, because it's, uh, it's uh, what's called, it's the uh, pipe, it's loaded, uh, then the entropy will be lower because some things are more likely than others, and so overall there is less surprise in the result. And if you think of uh, text in English, there's been a lot of studies on this, if uh, you look at not just the probability of letters, but also the probability uh, of pairs of letters, after a T you are more likely to have an H, uh, or an I uh, than, than other letters, uh, the entropy of text is very low. Each character can be encoded uh, with about one bit of information, which is why your uh, uh, loved uh, um, uh, spelling correctors work pretty well, or spelling uh, uh, predictor work pretty well, is because there is very little uncertainty when you start typing enough text. Now, um, the, 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 the really uh, important pro, uh, contribution of, of, of Shannon is to have formalized uh, information transmission, uh, where you have a source that emits, uh, uh, that wants to emit a message, the encoder encodes this message in the most efficient way using these probability distributions, then it goes over a channel, the channel is noisy, so some things may be changed, some things may disappear, so the Y that you get at the output is not exactly the X that you got at the input. Then you decode with the inverse of the encoder, so you, you had letters encoded into bits. Uh, on the decoder, you get bits uh, decoded into letters, and the destination can read the message. But some information is going to be lost uh, with this formula. Again, I'm going to details, um, but it captures the, the, the fact that uh, the, the information uh, that is transmitted can be uh, uh, sort of uh, damaged uh, uh, on the way, and we'll need that in a moment. And then the big uh, 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 contribution of Shannon is, uh, is Theorem 17 in his paper, uh, which is the capacity of a channel subject to a Gaussian noise, which is the typical noise you get when you send bits over a, over a wire. Uh, that has this formula, the capacity, which is the maximum transmitted information, is the bandwidth multiplied by this formula. Now, I just want you to take a picture of that formula, not try to understand it. Uh, P is the signal that is being sent, N is the noise. Okay, so why am I talking about all this? Uh, let's get back to, to this diagram where I had the information exchange between the user and the computer. If I'm thinking of what the user uh, is sending to the computer, it's sending messages, commands in, in some sort, that, as I said. And that seems to be kind of uh, uh, work well with Shannon's notion of information, that I'm sending information of the channel. There may be errors. Uh, I may mistype. I may mispoint. Or, or maybe the, 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 the mouse is not working well. So, so I'm emitting information that may not uh, arrive at the destination uh, exactly the same. Uh, from the computer back to the user, uh, the system is providing uh, typically a display in, in, uh, in traditional GUIs. So I think it's more where the, the notion of information from Gibson is, is meaningful there because the user is going to want to extract information from those displays and to do it uh, as efficiently as possible. Now, I'm going to apply this to a very mundane task. After all what we've seen over these two days, I feel like <laughs> it's kind of a downer. Um, pointing, isn't that exciting? Um, well, pointing is exciting because that's what you do the most when you use a computer. I mean, do you imagine the number of time you point, move your mouse, or, or tap on your screen every day to, to do anything with a computer? Uh, so if we were able to gain at least you know, 1%, 5% on each time you, 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 you tap or, or, or click, uh, we would save the humanity a you know, huge amount of time. Anyway, um, so pointing is difficult because on the computer you have many targets. Some targets are very small. If you think of a text that you can edit, every space between each pair of characters is a potential target. You also have all the buttons, all the menus, all the scroll bars, etc. And of course, what we want is to point quickly and to point precisely. And these are a trade-off. You cannot be very quick and very precise at the same time. So it's a little bit like the curve that we've seen between <laughs> power and simplicity. Uh, you know, we would like uh, to, to, to shift the curve, to be able to, to point a little bit faster and a bit more precise. But, but this trade-off is going to be there. 
And something that is often ignored in, in most pointing studies, and I will ignore it today, is the cost of error. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've all mispointed somewhere and closed the window that you very much regret <laughs> uh, the second after. So uh, integrating the cost of error uh, is, is uh, still a challenge today. Now, uh, stupid observation, but why do we need to point? I mean, we have all these fancy computers, you know, all this AI out there, we still spend our lives pointing. Well, the thing is that if the computer knew what I wanted to do and what I wanted to point at, it could do it for me. And so the point is, so to speak, that the computer does not know what I want to do. So this is really tied back to the notion of information because it means that uh, the computer has uncertainty about what I want to do. And my job is going to be to reduce this uncertainty uh, by providing information to the computer about what I want to do. The other thing is that currently, uh, human capabilities are the biggest uh, uh, limitation to pointing performance. You know, you can buy the, the, the best mouse you want. Uh, it, it, it's your muscles, it's your uh, visual system that will uh, define how good you are at pointing. Now, Paul Fitz has uh, studied uh, pointing as a psychologist, uh, also a pioneer in aviation safety. It was mentioned yesterday. Uh, also the author of this, uh, what uh, humans are good at, uh, what machines are good at list that uh, um, Thomas mentioned yesterday, but uh, is, is most known uh, in our field, at least, for uh, studying pointing. And is the, <laughs> he gave his name to the law called uh, Fitz Law, uh, which is uh, exploring this uh, speed precision trade-off in aimed movements. And so this is his... Uh, uh, apparatus to uh, come up with this law, two uh, targets, a pen, so the targets are actually strips of metal, the pen is also metallic, and so if you hit the target, it closes the circuit, and so you go back and forth, and you can very precisely time the time it takes to go from one to the other. And there are two parameters to this task, one is what's called an left target amplitude, but that we call distance, uh, d the distance to target, and the other parameter is the size of the target, the target width. This is what we call the 1D pointing because you only go back and forth, left and right. We don't do all the directions. And he predicted, and uh, his experiment supported, the fact that the movement time, the time it takes to, um, uh, to do one uh, pointing gestures, was proportional to what he called the index of difficulty, which is the log of 1 plus D over W. The distance gets longer, takes more time. The uh, size gets smaller, it takes more time. So D over W actually captures this, uh, this uh, uh, trade-off. Here's the data from his paper, beautifully aligned uh, regression between the index of difficulty uh, and the movement time. Um, and in HCI, uh, Fitzlaw is used heavily as a tool to compare pointing devices or pointing techniques. Um, because whether you're pointing, you're tapping on your screen, you're pointing with a mouse, with a trackpad, with your eyes, with your whatever, uh, this law is very robust. What changes is the K here. So, you know, the K is the slope of the curve that I had here. So if you have a lower uh, value for K, then you can point uh, more efficiently. You're still subjected to the, to the law, <laughs> but, but you can point more efficiently. Now, what's interesting is, uh, uh, I'm really going very slow here. <laughs> um, so uh, now, if you had taken the picture in your head of the formula of uh, capacity from uh, uh, Shannon, log uh, of one plus p over n, and uh, the one I just showed here, mt is uh, proportional to the index of difficulty, you see an analogy. And in fact, this analogy is very uh, compelling because the distance is a signal, the distance to the target is a signal you want to send to the system. How far is the target uh, that I want to reach? And the width of the target is the tolerance, the, uh, you know, how much you can uh, have noise that will uh, actually uh, uh, perturb this, this distance, uh, how, how wide you can, you can point around the, around, the, uh, around the center of the target. Now, this is an analogy, but you know, the units are different, so, and it's just based analogy because the two formulas look the same, which is kind of a, <laughs> a little bit weak. Um, now, we can actually derive the index of difficulty uh, as the uh, entropy of uh, a um, 
of a, a variable, the, if you imagine that between your starting point and the stopping point, you have, uh, you, you tiled several targets of size W, and your job is which one are you going to, uh, to select. Uh, here, I want to select the one at, at the position stop. But I could select any of the other ones, and so uh, the, the variable X uh, would be the uh, uh, values of the uh, possible center of the targets, starts at minus d.2 here, d.2 plus w plus 2w, etc. And if I cal calculate the entropy uh, of this, I get exactly the index of difficulty. Isn't that marvelous? Well, it is, it is, it is cute, but uh, there's no transmission here. So it's just, uh, it's not really using the notion of uh, uh, information theory as uh, formalizing the transmission of information. Now, uh, Julien Gori and Olivier Rioul and, and Yves Guillard uh, a few years ago, uh, took that on. Uh, Olivier, uh, Olivier Rioul is an uh, um, uh, accomplished uh, information theorist from Telecom Paris Tech. Um, and, uh, and, and they came up with this uh, model for how the user is transmitting information to the computer in a pointing task where the channel uh, has uh, a noise which is caused by uh, what they call neural noise that makes you, you know, not point exactly always where you want because you have uh, various sources of, uh, of noise in the motor system. And so, in short, uh, they were able to recover uh, the, the formula of uh, the capacity of that channel, uh, which shows once again the index of difficulty, 1 plus d over w, uh, but with this factor 1 minus e, where e is the error rate. And I think this is really a, a, an astonishing accomplishment to, to have linked uh, the notion of uh, uh, information from Shannon with uh, Fitts law and pointing in a way that is uh, very rigorous. Now, Fitts law has limits. Uh, you cannot point, if I'm sitting here and I want to uh, go and point at the switch at the other end of the room, I'm going to have to run, uh, and uh, this is not going to follow Fitts law, because Fitts law works only if you can accelerate as much as you can until you have to slow down. Uh, so typically the maximum distance is the amplitude of the arm, the maximum, um, the minimum target size is, is limited by uh, motor tremor, so, uh, you know, half a millimeter, say, and maximum distance about a meter, so the index of difficulty is about 11 bits. Um, and so all FIT studies, you know, use this kind of range because beyond that, it's, it's just not valid. There are other laws of movement. Uh, we talked about FIT's law in 1D. When you go to 2D, it's already complicated. Uh, there is goal passing where you cross a goal instead of clicking in it. There is a steering law where you, can traver where you try to traverse a tunnel. And all these have expressions with formulas uh, similar to what I have shown. So it's a very... Uh, um, uh, interesting field to, to try to really uh, capture this uh, uh, essential uh, type of interaction with, uh, uh, with predictive laws. Now, the thing I want to talk about now is how to beat Fitts law. Uh, now, it's frustrating that we spend so much time uh, uh, clicking and tapping and, and reaching for targets. Um, now, what if we think of pointing as a human-computer partnership? How can I have the computer help me point more efficiently? I mean, the, the computer should be able to do something there. Currently, it does not. In fact, pointing on a computer with a mouse is a little bit less efficient than pointing uh, in, in the physical world because of the device and, and et cetera. So uh, I'm going to have to uh, speed up here. First, extract user in intention. Um, Jerry Cazier gave uh, uh, a very nice uh, uh, presentation in uh, Wendy's lecture number four about the use of uh, pointer acceleration or transfer function. The fact that if I move my mouse a little bit, the cursor moves a little bit. But if I, move, if I make the same movement twice as fast, then the cursor is going to go further away, right? And that's capturing the intention that if I'm moving fast, I'm in the first phase of, of my pointing movement, it means I want to go far away. So let me get you go there even faster. But as soon as you slow down, the, the, the transfer function uh, is, uh, uh, is lower, meaning you still keep precision. Now, that works. Uh, Jerry Cazier did a lot of studies around this. 
uh, there is a real effect on performance, it's quite moderate. You, you cannot have that much of a gain. Even if you think you, know, you have your mouse set to the maximum acceleration and you're the king of the pointing, in practice, except for uh, extreme gamers, uh, it doesn't make that big a difference. But it's still convenient because it lets you use a mouse on a small surface or a small trackpad. Another idea um, was to say, well, uh, why don't let the system take advantage that I'm communicating information as I move to, to take over from me? Now, you all know inertial scrolling on your smartphone, where you start scrolling and the system keeps scrolling for you. Now, we did the same thing with the cursor, where uh, control the cursor with a trackpad, and if you lift your finger, depending on the uh, speed at liftoff, the cursor will continue uh, by itself. And then if it doesn't go where you want, you can stop it, you can redirect it, sort of like when you're pushing a hoop uh, if you're a kid. So it did improve, uh, so interestingly, it does not improve uh, pointing time. So uh, not very interesting, maybe, but it's, it's, it gives a very different feeling to really uh, sort of pushing the, the, the cursor rather than being in control all the time. And so it means that I'm transmitting the same amount of information in less time, because the, the time uh, over which I control the cursor is, is shorter than if I control it all, all over. And so um, I think there's something to explore here. Uh, if we could couple that with other methods I'm going to talk about. Now, second approach, the one that's been the most explore, explored, is to use information about the targets. Because one thing that the computer has that the real world does not have is the computer knows where the targets are. And so uh, if we know this landscape of, of targets, we can help the user, and especially if we also know the distribution of probability that uh, the user has to hit a particular target. So in semantic pointing here, what we did uh, with uh, Renaud Blanc um, and, uh, and Yves Guillard was to decouple the way things look uh, for you, the user, from the way things look for the computer, uh, for the mouse. So here you see a dialog box with three buttons. Uh, one is dangerous, don't save. One is probably the default and the most likely, save. Now, from your mouse, uh, what you see, what the mouse sees, or the landscape, is the one at the bottom, meaning big save button, easier to reach than the don't save, which is much smaller and harder to reach. Now, this little video illustrates what happens. So here, uh, that's what I see on the left. The right is the, the, what the mouse sees. Right now, we are in uh, normal uh, pointing, so it's exactly the same uh, on the left and on the right. Now, I activate semantic pointing, and you'll see on the right, as I approach this tiny resize button, it gets bigger. Um, and uh, when I approach the title, it gets a little bit bigger, not as much. When I approach an icon, it gets bigger as well. And so the idea is that, in a sense, you compress the empty space between targets because there's nothing interesting there. But when you approach a target, you can decide how important it is and how much you want to enlarge it. And what we showed is that the pointing time is predicted by the enlarged target size, not by the visual target size, which is uh, really a, a real gain. Now, you can push this to the limit uh, by having uh, what uh, uh, Yves Guillard called the, uh, object pointing, where your cursor is not even going to go into the, the, the empty space. It's going to jump to the next target. Uh, as soon as you exit the target, it's going to find the next one in that direction and land there. Now, this is the one and only example I know where we actually beat Fitz law because we have constant pointing time. Constant pointing time. That's super cool, right? Well, except that when you have multiple targets, if you don't land on the right one, then you're going to really spend a lot of time getting back to where you wanted, and et cetera. So um, error correction is so costly that, in fact, the advantage of this constant pointing time uh, in standard uh, sort of a setup is, is, not, uh, is not useful. Now, this idea of uh, uh, sort of ignoring uh, empty space uh, gave rise to the bubble pointer by uh, Grossman and Balakrishnan. So here you say, well, even if you're not pointing on the target, uh, since the only thing you want to point at are targets, I will make you point on the closest target. So we build what's called the Voronoi diagram of the targets, uh, this uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 tiling of the space where uh, each uh, area represent all the points that are closer to the, to the target in it than to any other target. And so uh, in uh, uh, the video should play here. No, it didn't. Hello. 
Yes. And so you see the bubble, the cursor gets bigger to, uh, oh, that was too fast. Uh, the cursor gets big enough to, to enclose the, the closest target. And, and so you can minimize travel time because the targets are effectively the size of these tiles here. This was improved by uh, Olivier Chapuis and colleagues uh, with Dynaspot, where uh, they combine, in fact, a bubble-like cursor that, that expands, um, not as much as we saw before because it's a bit distracting, but also if you slow down, it turns into a regular cursor so you can actually point uh, individual pixels on the screen. Another uh, possibility is this idea that we can expand targets as you get close to them. Uh, again, extracting the intention. If, if I'm uh, next to a target and I'm slowing down, probably I want to point at the target nearby, so why not make it bigger then? So here we are modifying both the visual space and the motor space. Uh, both uh, McGuffin and McGuffin and, and ourselves with Shumin Jai showed that it works. Um, and, uh, but in fact, it's not really valuable because in real settings, targets tend to be packed together. And if some of you uh, know the, uh, the dock from uh, Mac OS, which is the row of icons at the bottom, you can put it in a mode where when you approach it, the, the, the icon next to the cursor gets bigger. So it expands. But the problem is that because all the, uh, all the targets are tiled together, uh, they need to push uh, the targets around it, which means that as I move my cursor horizontally, uh, even though the target gets bigger, it sort of slips under my cursor um, and in fact, its effective size is not any bigger. So expanding targets, good idea, but not much practical application. Uh, drag and pop. Um, so here the idea is uh, for dragging instead of pointing, that when I drag towards a, a direction, the system will bring to me the icons where I would want to, to drop my uh, dragged icon. So a very clever idea from Patrick Bodish here. Um, it works only for drag, uh, so it's not a general solution for pointing. Uh, I don't... <laughs> okay, so um, then we wanted to break another uh, aspect of FITSO, which is the limitation in, in, in precision and distance. And for this, we move to zoomable user interfaces. Now, these days, we all know zoomable user interfaces with Google Maps where you, know, you zoom in, you zoom out, you pan, et cetera. Uh, in a zoomable interface, you can uh, potentially zoom indefinitely. Here it's a, a drawing interface. I can, uh, uh, I can keep drawing and, and then zooming in, zooming out. What we showed with uh, Yves Guillard is that when you do this movement uh, to go from A to B in a map, where you have to zoom out first, then get to have your target in view, and then zoom in and, and pan to adjust to get to the final target. Very different uh, type of motion than pointing from A to B. If you do that, um, uh, so I don't have time to explain those diagrams, but uh, we did this with indices of difficulty over 30. Remember, regular pointing gets to ID about 10. 10 means 2 to the power of 10, a ratio of about 1,000 between the distance and the size of the target. Uh, ID 30 means 2 to the power 30, that's several billion, uh, between the size of the target and their distance. It's like if I'm here and I want to point, uh, the, the analogy that Eve uh, takes is, I want to go pick a flower in a garden in New Zealand from here, from Paris. That's the precision of the task and I can do it with a prediction that is perfectly in line with Fitz's law. Uh, we played with the size of the target as, uh, 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 the, the size of the view, because we figured if the view gets smaller and smaller, like on the watch, it's gonna be easier to lose the target and then it's gonna affect performance, which we demonstrated with this formula that movement time is proportional still to ID, but divided by view size if the view is small enough. Uh, I'm going to skip more to zoom. Sorry for Caroline. Um, and I want to get to the last bit here, which is how to uh, challenge the user. Now, usually we want the computer to help us. <laughs> um, but it turns out that there is a, um, a way to think of uh, extracting more information from the user by challenging it. You know the game 20 questions, right? You have 20 questions to find the name of the person I have in my head. 
usually the first question that's being asked is, is it a man or a woman? Because that sort of divides the choices by half. Um, and so the idea here is we are going to uh, challenge the user so that the user gives us more information uh, in their next input. So the user has a target in mind, um, and uh, the system has some prior knowledge, a probability distribution of, uh, uh, of uh, target probability. From that, it can compute an uncertainty with the formula I showed earlier. And uh, the goal of the game is to reduce this uncertainty to zero. For this, the computer uh, provides a display, which here we see sort of as an input to the user. We're shifting the thing on its head, in a sense. Uh, I show the user something. The user responds with uh, uh, what we call an input in HCI, but it's, it's actually it's, it's, it's response to, to, the, to the system prompt, in a sense. Um, and this uh, input carries some information. And so this information will reduce the uncertainty of the uh, computer and hopefully will go down to zero when the target is reached. Now, the key idea here is there's not much we can do on the input side. The user decides what he wants to do. Uh, but we can play with the feedback. We can choose the feedback so that the expected amount of information uh, the system will gain from the next input is maximized. And so the uncertainty will go down faster. Now, formulas, it works. There's math behind it. It's based on information theory, measure of entropy, base rules to update the computer knowledge about what the user goal is, and the measure of the information gain, how much information I have extracted from the user at each step, and how much information I can expect to extract from the next step. Now, the example I have here is uh, navigating a, a multi-scale map. Suppose I'm uh, uh, looking at the map around Denver, so what I see on my screen is what's in the black square, and I want to navigate to go to New York. Now, the system doesn't know I want to go to New York. So the only actions I can do here is say, go uh, in one of the eight cardinal directions. I don't say how far, uh, or zoom in uh, the center area. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm in Denver, I want to go to New York, I want to go to the east. Now, it turns out that users are not reliable. And uh, we, we did some studies, and people make mistakes, or maybe they don't know their geography. And in 95% of the time in a situation, they will go right. In 5%, they will go left. And the system can embody this knowledge about user behavior. Uh, we update the knowledge uh, and calculate uh, the uh, view that maximize the expected information gain, which in practice means uh, I'm here on the left. Uh, the system is going to look at all the views it could show me um, and calculate the expected information gain for any possible target based on any of these views, which is a huge calculation, which is the drawback of the method. Um, and based on that, it's going to decide which one is best for it, the system. Not for me, the user, for it, the system. And it's going to be this one. Why is this one? Because if I'm here, if I want to go to New York, I will say go east. If I want to go to Kansas City, I will say go west. If I want to go to Chicago or uh, Washington, I will zoom in. So my next input uh, is going to give it more information than if the view had all these four uh, uh, cities in it or only one of them. So it's making this uh, compromise in a sense, uh, but it's also challenging me because I'm going to have to really decide the next turn, well, where, where is it now? And so we calculate then the gain, and uh, then we can loop. I moved here, and then I will still go uh, to the left, uh, to the right. Um, as I go to the right, the probability of things on the left is going down and down, uh, and, and, and that sort of uh, improves the system. So the way this, uh, uh, this looks is, is, is a bit disturbing, because you make a move, the system goes somewhere, then you have to realize, well, where am I? Uh, oh, it's not where I wanted, so I go back and then I go in. But in three moves, I can be uh, over Paris. Uh, if I wanted to go to Helsinki instead, um, uh, so it, it starts sort of the same. Uh, now uh, I'm going that direction. I went a bit too far, and then I go there, and I'm in Helsinki. Now, so what we found is performance is increased by about 40% compared to standard navigation. And the, the further away you navigate, the, the bigger the gain. Uh, 
But what we see if you look at, at how the, uh, we approach the target over time, in blue is uh, with standard navigation, so you see I make steps, uh, and, uh, and here we didn't have the, the, the animation in the video, it was sort of uh, uh, jumps from, from one view to the next. But when we use big nav, we have this big reduction in ID level, uh, meaning I'm going really uh, fast towards the, the, the target, but then there's this long pause uh, because I have to figure out the users to figure out where am I now, what, what am I doing next? So now there's probably uh, ways to improve uh, that information uh, through maybe uh, <laughs> uh, invariance and, and, and better visual feedback. Uh, but the fact that we can uh, gain 40% on the navigation task and the pointing task essentially is quite, uh, quite spectacular. We did the same thing for file retrieval. And it worked the same. Uh, here we have the traditional list of files at the bottom, and at the top we provide a set of uh, uh, candidates, uh, but they are designed by the big uh, algorithm, so it's not the most likely, it's the one where if you click on one of them, it will tell me, the system, more information about where you want to go. And not going into details, the gains were also 40% compared to the best known technique, which is called AR file here, that's using also some sort of a predictive uh, information, uh, and 64% uh, faster than your regular going through folders uh, in your finder. <coughs> Conclusion. <laughs> um, information is a very fruitful concept for, for interaction. Uh, it's kind of disappointing, though, that none of these techniques I've showed are in any commercial uh, product nowadays, even though they improve uh, interaction uh, and, uh, and efficiency uh, of pointing. Uh, the use of information as, as, as a concept uh, can be used and has been used for things like text entry, uh, especially because of this low entropy of, of text, uh, for command selection and for other applications. So to wrap this up, um, I think theory-driven HCI leads to generative theories that create novel and powerful techniques. Um, and uh, information theory is one of these uh, source theories that, that is of interest uh, as a source of inspiration and also a tool to uh, create future human-computer partnerships. Thank you.